outsider art is a term for art that has been made by people that haven't had any formal art training. Usually outsider artists create a large body of work in their lifetime or something big and unique um, as they tend to have a strong urge to create. This ranges from detailed paintings to large outdoor environments which are full of sculptures that portray um, their unique vision on the world. Um, so I'll give you plenty of examples of outsider artists later. Um, but tonight my talk begins here at Linklidden's famous rhino statue um, because the mosaic artwork that was done on the bottom of the rhino statue, which was done as a project by Creative Futures, um, is an example of artwork that's been created by people that haven't had any formal art training, as it was done by community members from Lockside and Linklidden. Um, so I think it's a great example of what can be achieved when people are giving a, given a stimulus and a bit of time and the right materials and they can create something that can be enjoyed by many. So I feel like that is what outsider artists have done and uh, yeah, just thought that this would be a great place to start and let's have a little look around. We all have the ability to create, which can be therapeutic, enjoyable and rewarding. So I feel like the outsider artists that we're going to explore show just that. Uh, in case you're not aware of what an outsider artist is, um, I'll give you a quick snapshot of history. So in 1912 in Germany, there was a group of artists called the Der Blauer, uh, Der Blau Writer Group. And they sort of started noticing um, things that were created by people that were mentally ill or by children or by peasants. And they sort of noticed that they had this um, expressive power, like a sort of raw artistic power that um, couldn't be achieved if you had um, sort of been sophisticated and had more uh, intellect about the art world after being to art school. Um, this interest in um, artwork created by people in mental asylums continued in the 1920s and there was a couple of books written about it. Um, first of all there was um, a book called A Psychiatric Patient as Artist um, and that was written about Adolf Wolfley who was a mental patient and he spontaneously took up drawing and it seemed to calm him. Um, so in his lifetime he actually did hundreds of detailed illustrations and he was trying to sort of create his own imaginary life story. So he obviously had all these sort of visions and dreams in his head and he just had to get them out onto paper. Um, the second book was uh, Artistry of the Mentally Ill, which brought together thousands of examples of the artwork that was being cre cre uh, created by mentally ill patients. So uh, this book actually, um, there's quite a lot of famous avant-garde artists in uh, Europe that sort of it caught their eye and um, I suppose at the time everybody was trying to start new art movements and everybody was being really intellectual about what art was so this was like really different to what everybody else was doing. Um, so a French artist called Jean de Buffy, he was really interested and he started going around some of the asylums and he started his own uh, collection and he uh, came up with the term art brut, which actually means raw art. And um, so that's what it was initially called. It was initially called art brut. Um, and it wasn't until the 1970s that um, somebody from England called it outsider art, um, just um, as a new term. Uh, so when Jean de Buffy was going around the asylums, he came across a guy called Carlo Zanelli. Um, so he was, um, a guy that had been brought up in the countryside in Italy and then he'd went to um, he'd volunteered for the Spanish Civil War and when he was out there he kind of quickly developed a sort of schizophrenia and um, so he had to go back home and he was taken to a psychiatric hospital and uh, he sort of 
lived this very isolated life for 10 years but then the psychiatric hospital created a painting workshop and uh, himself and some other patients were basically given free reign to do whatever they wanted. Well, they could paint all day if they wanted. So uh, Carlo would spend long hours, sometimes eight hours a day, just painting. And uh, in the 60s, his work was actually exhibited in galleries. So it started becoming more mainstream. Um, but outsider art, um, it's not just people that are mentally ill. Um, there's lots of uh, people that maybe seem a bit quirky or eccentric, um, but there's there's also stories that of of people that you know um, worked all their life as a postman or worked for their local council, and then they just had this um, these new ideas that they hadn't achieved what they wanted to achieve, and they wanted to build these fantastic things to sort of um, make uh, make something more of their life. Uh, so yeah, so a lot of them do say that they have dreams, visions, and these internal monologues that compel them to create. Um, so yeah, as I was saying about the, the postman, he, uh, whenever he was going on his route, he would always pick up some stones that caught his eye. And he started building these large um, s sculptures out of all the stones that he found on his, his route. So... Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, like one of my personal favourites is the big sort of sculpture parks that have, um, people have built. And they usually just start off being one person's vision and then they start creating it. Um, and at first they're seen as wacky, but then they actually get quite a lot of attention um, and the public want to go and visit them. And then they, they end up becoming tourist attractions. So I'll give you a quick um, tour of the world of outsider art environments. Uh, first of all, we've got um, one of my personal favourites is Isaiah Zagar's Magic Gardens in Philadelphia. Uh, he does a lot of mosaic work and um, breaks up glass bottles and um, he's saved up money to buy a lot of the buildings in Philadelphia just so he can mosaic them. And yeah, um, now it's like a major tourist attraction. We've also got Simon Rodia's Watts Towers in Los Angeles. Uh, these are huge, huge towers that can be seen from um, a large distance. And he didn't even use scaffolding or ladders. He just sort of tied himself to the side of the structures and built them taller and taller. Uh, we've also got Nikki de Saint Fal's Tarot Garden in Tuscany in Italy. Um, she was quite a famous artist in the 60s, but she wasn't trained at all. She just had this urge to create. Um, and she uh, created a, a garden that was inspired by the tarot cards. Uh, we've got Nick Chand Sinai's Rock Garden in in India and he's the one that basically just worked for his sort of local council and he knew um, where there was places in the town that not a lot of people went to because he had like access to like the town planning maps and he just went to like one of these sort of quiet spots and he started building these little mosaic people. Uh, and then, yeah, like, when a, when it actually got found out, uh, the they found that everybody really liked to go and visit them. And then it ended up that the council gave them load, uh, money and his own personal workers and a truck so that he could actually pick up materials and keep building it because it became um, a way of, of getting tourists to come to the town. So yeah, that's quite a, a fun story. Uh, we've also got Dr. Evermore's Forever Tron in Wisconsin, Howard Finster's Paradise Gardens in Georgia, Leonard Knight's Salvation Mountain in California, 
Um, this is also pretty awesome. Um, as you can see, it's actually devoted to God and like what he wants to promote like um, his love for God. Um, but he basically just uses the clay that's in the desert there and he, well, he, yeah, he mixes the clay with water and he, he builds his, uh, keeps on building the mountain and uh, when people come to visit, they kind of donate him paint. So a lot of it's made from paint that's been donated to him. So yeah, as you can see, a lot of them are made from everyday found and broken up objects, but they've sort of put them into wonderful, colourful displays and yeah, really went against the norm. So yeah, imagine how much more interesting Dumfries would look if, if that's what we all did all day and we'd definitely uh, be better at reducing, reusing and recycling if we uh, broke everything up and made wonderful sculptures. This is just a quick tour of the history and some examples of outsider art but I would definitely recommend delving a bit deeper because there's so many interesting characters. Uh, so if you're interested, there is a wonderful documentary series by the musician Jarvis Cocker. It's called Journeying into the Outside. And there's loads of information that you can find about outsider artists. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's just so inspiring that they create so much in their lifetime and they don't need any confirmation or recognition from others. Uh, they just end up seem, seeming to get, get it. Uh, yeah, and I suppose that's not something that comes naturally to everybody and if you go to art school you are looking to get skills so that you can get a job and um, it's not always an option to spend all day just making sculptures but at least uh, looking at these examples um, helps us to maybe be a bit more free and accepting um, about our own work or about other work, um, other people's work and yeah just be more experimental and um, yeah so thank you very much for listening and uh, yeah what are you waiting for get out there and build yourself a glass bottle sculpture <laughs>